Well, good morning to you and welcome to Real Talk. I'm Ryan Jesperson. We appreciate you joining us live on this Tuesday morning. I'm signing into uh, our live YouTube stream right around the same time that many of you are, I'm sure, because uh, this has become a thing. Uh, Samuel G. Brooks, the producer of this program, we were talking and we knew before we went on the air back on November 23rd, we knew that we wanted to have some way uh, for viewers and for listeners to be able to correspond with the show. And we thought, well, it's obvious we'll have our hashtag Real Talk RJ. And we thought, oh, yeah, and then there's the, there's the comment thread on YouTube as well. There's the comments. People can leave comments. And we thought, yeah, I mean, like, you know, you got to kind of keep an eye on those. because We might get one or two, but they're all going to be trolls anyway. Trolls, yeah. conspiracy theories, uh, all kinds of lunacy. And it's turned out, uh, let me just let me just sort of get to it right now here. Like, like Chris Sturwald, first out of the gates this morning, uh, he says, good morning. He was the first one there. Then Mr. Cynic says, good morning, real talkers. I like that. Real talkers. Jonathan. I'm just, I, I'm just enjoying Mr. Cynic in general because yeah, he, has, he's he has great. some great so hot Jonathan takes. Jonathan goes on to yeah. say, good morning. And then Mark says, good morning. Happy Festivus Eve. Good morning from Riley and Dwayne and Colleen and Julie and Fatima. Like everyone is starting to chime in. The community is coming together. This is great. And uh, probably the biggest reason why it's great is about six minutes ago, uh, one of our marquee guests for today's show just pulled the shoot. So, so we're realizing the show's lineup is going to change a little bit, which is completely fine. Uh, it's totally fine. These things happen. Here's what it means. It means we've got more talk time today. So my brain is immediately sifting through. We're coming up with the different options because this was literally at 824. So eight minutes ago. So now I'm realizing, for example, we've got some emails locked and loaded. I've got a letter to the show I want to read. Now we can leave, we've got some flex time to let it breathe. Sam, we can explore these ideas. I actually kind of isn't feel. It, like, isn't it great to not have another show just like waiting for you to get out of the is, studio? There's not another yeah. show waiting for us to get out of the studio. We can take our time. Heck, maybe we'll be here until four o'clock this afternoon, Sam. Who knows? Yeah, probably not. Probably not. Probably not. Uh, we are going to maybe on Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. Those shows uh, <laughs> are, are 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 shaping up to be a little bit of fun. Well, why don't we why don't we take some time to talk about those two shows? I was first, say, I'm going to let you know. Yeah. yeah, first I'm going to let you know. Uh, obviously, each and every day, we want to remind you that we would not be on the air without the incredible support of our title sponsor, our presenting sponsor, Bitcoin. Well, this is right around the time of year where you're realizing you forgot to get a gift for that one special someone. Like, maybe it's your boss, maybe it's your star employee. Are people exchanging gifts at work these years? I wonder if people are... We don't have any precedent here because we've just started. We don't know. It's going to be a little bit awkward, actually, when I give Sam a diamond necklace and he doesn't even... He's, like, it for men. Like, a diamond necklace for men. It's going to be wonderful. Oh, I or, can't wait. or I could just get you a Bitcoin gift card. Did you know that there are Bitcoin gift cards? This makes you look like the most savvy gift giver of 2020 into 2021 you just you, they open it they go what bitcoin really they go i don't have I've, I've been wondering about bitcoin i've never had bitcoin and you go well now i've got you started right and you're watching you're looking and you're going bitcoin's like in the thousands of dollars i can't spend you don't have to buy the whole thing you can buy 20 bucks of bitcoin 50 bucks of bitcoin 100 bucks of bitcoin 500 bucks of bitcoin whatever you want and at bitcoin well they can help you out it's the easiest way to do it just check out the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com Real Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. I love this. This is just... Everyone's just... Like, the positivity continues. I'm not, I, I won't do this all morning. Or maybe I will. 
But on the YouTube comments, like Rose just posts a photo of her coffee. Rose, here's to you. By the way, we're getting uh, onto the short list of shows that I'll be doing without an official Real Talk mug, an announcement coming in the new year. Uh, Crazy Chick 2 chimes in and says, okay, yeah, yes, troll checking in here. Uh, <laughs> good morning to you, Crazy Chick 2, and thanks for being here. And Genevieve and Audra and Mike and Ryan Crawford, who's watching from snowy Calgary. Did you see the photos out of Calgary last Ooh. night? Like a huge, a buddy of mine has one of these Kong dog toys, you know, because he's Lucy, uh, TJ. He's got beautiful Lucy, who's uh, one of the most beautiful little pitties that you've ever seen. Scene, but she needs strong toys and he had a Kong toy that was standing up on the picnic table outside and he was marking it on his Instagram so he was like you know 6 p.m. 8 p.m. 10 p.m. the snow is just falling and falling I've seen people on social media th this morning uh, my cousin Andrew saying that he, he got about six feet out of his driveway to go to work and he went nah I don't think so. I think it's a great day to stay home so good morning to Calgary. Uh, I, I like the uh, meteorology via dog toy. That's Meteorology a, via dog toy. Yeah, yeah it's the a, units of measurement. Yep, absolutely. K Kong measurement. Uh, Sean, <laughs> Sean's tuned in this morning, and he says this morning, he says it kind of feels like the start of Romper Room. This feels like the start of a Romper Room episode. Do you remember Romper Room? I think I might be a little young for Romper Room. You're a little, room. what are you, like early 30s? 31. You're 31, yeah, yeah early 30s. So I've, I've heard of Romper you're, Room. You're it is, just a kid. It's a, it's a piece of pop culture that I'm not, you know, I'm not immune to. I, I know, know that it's existed and, and you know, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, if I can actually think back Back to my childhood, like a uh, you know, romp, romper room is not something that ever really came up. I'm sort, I'm, I'm looking it up. I'm googling it. Uh, children's television series. Wow, an American. I just about gave Canada credit for romper room. I thought it was Canadian. So did I. It's not. It's an American children's television series franchised and syndicated from 1953 to 1994. Huh. Very interesting. Produced by Claster Television. Okay, I always thought it was a CBC production. But see, the funny thing is, is like, I don't remember Romper Room, but like I had older iconic children. Like I had Mr. Dress Up, right? And I had Mr. Rogers and I had, you know, that kind of stuff too. So it's just like, because I'm just thinking like, when did Mr. Dress Up go on the air? Yeah, I mean, I guess we could just Google these types of things all day. What's your guess? Let's make it kind of a trivia. Mr. Dress Up. 70 something. Yeah, I'm going to say, say like 75. Yeah, I'll say 76 just right. to play that Price is Right, right game. Sounds good. I'll just get a little bit earlier than you. Mr. Yes, Mr. Sinek. As well, the Polka Dot Door. Fantastic 67. Show. 67. Wow. Uh, Mr. Dress Up went on the air. Um, 1996 went off the air. <clears throat> now, here's. do you remember Mr. Dress Up's real name? He's a legend. Uh, Ernie Coombs. Wow. You had it up on the screen. In no, I didn't. Promise? No, no promise. You come look at my station. That's yeah. two points for you, Sam. Oh. That's two points for you, which puts you just behind uh, Dustin, who's got five points. Everybody's wondering what these. We need a more sophisticated list. No, I like that. I like that. It's like you like this just a post it on your the, desk. This is the official real talk list of points. And people are going to say, are you actually seriously tracking points? I am actually seriously tracking points. Dustin and people are going to go like we know that there are hardcore members of this uh, viewing and listening audience that have never missed a minute of real talk, which, by the way, is amazing. And we love you. And we can't wait for our uh, we, we announced it yesterday. I, I sort of did a soft announce yesterday on my Twitter of the 2021 real talk solstice soiree. Uh, which is going to be, obviously, it'll be December 21st of 2021, so a year from now. It's going to be kind of our first holiday party, and we're going to host it with a whole bunch of people, and like you. And we don't know, this is news to Sam right now, too. He's going, you haven't mentioned this to me. You're right, We've I have tossed ideas We've around. We've tossed ideas yeah, around. Yeah, we, we didn't have anything committed yet. Like, we might, like, maybe it'll be a parking lot party here at our studio. Maybe it'll be a, a venue that's kind of cooler, maybe in the River Valley. Maybe we get food trucks. Fun. Right, food trucks and a big bonfire. I'd be down. Bonfire, that. maybe yeah. do it. Maybe do it at like an ODR so people can skate. Oh, I like that idea. Hey, have like a fire beside the rink. Yeah. Uh, maybe like a food truck. We could have a couple kegs just in the snowbanks. Nice. Right. Someone there to pump the kegs for everybody. Can we um, get a band. Yeah. Like a small stage. A, we'll throw, maybe, we'll throw I, a band I, in there. I think probably yeah. Ayla Brook. That and seems the sound logical. Men yeah. Probably should play our first. You know, so so we've got a year to think about it, a year to plan it. So you can send us your ideas, friends. Real talkers, is it going to be real talkers? I kind of like that. Real talkers, real talkers. Yeah. Said, Good morning, real talkers. I like it. Yeah. Um, okay. Now people are no, okay. Now so here we go. People are talking about like Fraggle Rock, Popcorn Playhouse, Buckshot, Buckshot. Wow. How's that for a throwback? Uh, Laurel's celebrating because it's 
364 days until the big soiree. Judy says, well, what about a Zoom party? Now, here's the thing, Judy. Here's the thing. We kind of already thought of that. We've already thought of this, and we're very excited. So it was important to us right out of the gates that Real Talk be accessible to everybody and free. Okay, and so we were able to do that with the support of our amazing sponsors, uh, who we tell you about through the show. We're also uh, able to see this journey really accelerate and ramp up and do things like, uh, do you mind taking a camera four for a second, Sam? See, I love being able to say that, camera four. So do you notice, if, if you notice, there are a couple things that have changed since we went on the air. Number one, the window coverings behind Sam have been drastically upgraded, drastically upgraded it doesn't look like a 1980s sort of a office slash questionable condo i think i've stayed in some weird hotels that have had weird hotels like yeah you're right hotels where you you lay the towel the towel's like rough um you know what i mean it's not a yeah. soft towel it's a rough towel but you lay it down over the bed because you don't actually lay on the on the duvet you know when you go to hotels and like the, the towels in your room are nice and the towels at the pool are just like paper you're like what is with these? yeah stuff? it's so people don't steal them yeah I think. probably uh the lights have also been drastically improved as you can see so these are a couple of things that we've done with the support and the help uh the incredible uh monthly support that we see from our patreon supporters and you go, what's patreon well patreon is basically it makes it nice and easy you go to ryanjesperson.com here's the pitch you go to ryanjesperson.com right at the top you click on patreon and then it gives you an option uh, to to basically commit five bucks a month or so to the show whatever you feel like uh and that's the thing you're like well what are the rules how does it work there are no rules and it kind of doesn't really work anyway except to say you sign up and and once a month, it just kind of takes it off your credit card. So, so a lot of you are getting, you know, five bucks a month, some 10, some 20 bucks a month. It's absolutely amazing. But you're allowing us to do things like uh, ensure that we can continue to, op, you know, operate uh, in, in a way that would, you know, be a quality broadcast, something you would expect. It allows us to entertain ideas like bringing on other team members, uh, broadening our coverage, paying for content, like, like some of the things coming up. I mean, Geez, to get into it, the municipal elections coming up in the fall. We've got a big, huge plan on how we're going to cover municipal elections across the province of Alberta. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you know us, it's going to be fun. But the Patreon also provides an opportunity for us to take a look at a specific community within our greater listening audience. Look to them and say, hey, you know what? We really appreciate what you're doing. When I got canned, when I lost my job a while back, a lot of people reached out and said, hey, if you're thinking of doing a show, whatever you're doing, we would pay for it. We would support you. We would make sure that that could be a reality. And we went, okay. So when we set up the website, we set up the Patreon, and it's blown our minds. We're so appreciative of that. So New Year's Eve morning, which is uh, coming up in, in about a week and a half, approximately, next Thursday morning, the morning of December 31st, Real Talk is always available to everyone for free, except for the morning of December 31st, where we will be doing a special broadcast for our Patreon supporters. Here's the thing. You still have time to become a Patreon supporter. So if you don't want to miss that show, and it's basically going to be live and interactive, same time slot, we're going to go. It's just going to be a Zoom party. It's, it's going to be great. It's a Zoom party yep. is what it is. And we're going to hang out. Sam's going to moderate. Um, and because if we had everybody's mics hot at the same time, it probably wouldn't work because we're expecting, I mean, put it this way, the invitations are going to, are going to be going out to a pretty significant number of people. So it, the party's capped at 500, by the way. Uh, so you've got to be in the first 500. Um, and if you get in there, we're going to have about an hour and a half where our, our coffees are, are going to be a, a Christmas cream color, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, we I might get some mimosas going mimosas? as well. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Um, as long as it's not like, I mean, you could, you could have a coffee stout. I might have a Caesar. A that's Caesar a, is a great that's idea. a great idea. A Caesar is a great idea. Now, you're going to want to kind of plan and plot out. I don't know how, how it goes for you when you're getting into the wobbly pops early in the morning. But do you go like Caesar, then mimosa? To me, that's kind of like, Ugh. like, I think I'd, I'd go probably uh, Bailey's and coffee first or Rig Hand or Hanson or whichever sort of coffee creamer we're going to go with. Then I think I would transition to mimosa. Then I think I would transmission to Caesar because Caesar is the gateway to beer. And then once you're on the beers, you know, it sounds I mean? like a pretty good New Year's Eve to me. I I think that order makes sense. So then I'm, the, I'm thinking back. There's a there's a few times when Kelly and I will just 
make ourselves mimosas because it's a Saturday morning, so why not? And I find myself double fisting mimosa and coffee a lot, so I might be doing that. Yeah. I, I agree. The Caesar's got to come later in the day. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you go Caesar to beer, and then I think beer, you start to get bloated, so you go beer to white wine, maybe? Hmm. And then you make the white wine to red wine transition, you have dinner, and then the red wine transitions you into the scotch. And then and then it's KO lights out. Who are we kidding? Right? You've been drinking. And, since and once again, real talk at eight forty five AM. What are you? We're, we've laid out a full day of boozing. Yeah. So that'll be <laughs> December thirty first. Um, and you're going, Well, how do we find out more about this? Go to RyanJesperson.com, click on the Patreon link, and then uh, the morning of, or we'll probably do it the night before. We'll figure it out. Um, if, you, if you're a subscriber to our Patreon, you know that we can message you from that platform. We're going to put the Zoom details there, and then we'll see you at 830 on Thursday morning, on the morning of December 31st. Otherwise, uh, we've got shows all the way up to the 30th, and then we'll be back on the air. I think it's Monday, January 4th, correct? will be our first show of 2021. Um, <clears throat> is this true? On, on, on the YouTube comments, Liz, listener says, Mr. Sinek, at the funeral of Mr. Dress Up, his son went to the tickle trunk and pulled out a spider costume. He did his father's eulogy in a freaking spider costume. Is that true? That's amazing. Wow, that's really cool. Nancy says, ooh, I'm impressed. You mix the grape and the grain. Is there any other way? That would be a great, that would be a great band name. It's not like a folk band. The grape and the grain? The grape and the grain. Yeah. Huh? Like you're playing Edmonton Folk Fest, playing on the hill, see on the hill in 2021. I'd, I'd uh, sit on the hill and listen to that for sure. I think the grape and the grain. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Um, let's remind everybody how excited we are to be partnered up with Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm driving into work and uh, we've all been there before. The roads are like, they're not, they're not like super crazy today. I mean, if you're down in the southern part of the province, they're nuts. Uh, but like there was like th that little dusting that made it kind of slippery. And as I'm coming in and I'm not, not coming in hot, I was under the speed limit, kids. But I still had a little bit of momentum behind me, and then I went to make the left turn, and I could kind of feel that the tires might kind of go out on me a little bit. Here's the thing. There's a police officer parked, like, right there. I'm like, am I going to go rally racing around this corner? I mean, like, I could. I mean, I could. I always tell Wyatt when he's in the truck. I say, you know, Dad's, like, a good driver, hey? Carrie just rolls her eyes. Oh, my gosh. But there was no going sideways. The, the, the traction control, the technology in this 2020 Jeep Grand Cherokee was just like, -na 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 -na. if you've ever driven one of these things, it's like, bop, 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 like this tire gets a bit more of this. And then all of a sudden, just around the corner, nice and gave the gave the 5.0 a little wave. What's up? What's up, everybody? Good morning. Driving nice and slow, responsible here in my 2020 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Best vehicles in the winter that you'd find. St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge is where we found those. Also super excited to be partnering up with Friesen Brothers. You're now down to the point, what is the, is the 22nd of December today? If you've not made your plan for Christmas dinner and you're going, oh, like I'm going to, I'm going to do stuffing in a box because that's too, way too much time. And it's, are there even turkeys left right now? I don't know. Mashing potatoes is such hard work and I wish I could just be with my family. Here's the thing. At their 14 locations across Alberta, their 15th, soon to open in South Edmonton, Friesen Brothers team of Red Seal chefs has you covered. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Check out Friesen Brothers today. Now, the reason I wanted to tee up Friesen Brothers is we got a remarkable letter yesterday. Buckle up, real talkers. Is this going to become a thing if we keep saying it? I'm not prepared to commit yet to, to, to the audio, the real talkers. I don't think I, I, it's a good, it will put it on the working list. Real I, talkers. It's, it's growing on me. It, yeah. It's like, it's something that like kind of irked me as soon as I first heard him. It's like, no, real talkers. We're going to have a nation of real talkers. Yeah. We want, we want real talkers everywhere. Yeah. There's no fake talk here. We're real talkers. Real talkers. All right, real talkers. The, the other thing I want to embrace. We'll, and, and we'll workshop is, it. Yeah. Oh, uh, the other thing I want to embrace as, as a bit of a motto, slogan, whatever we want to use it is. And, yeah. and I've actually noticed our fans have been saying this a lot is pass the mic. That's what we we'll do pass here. Pass the mic. We pass the I mic. I like that. I like that. That's another. That could be another hashtag. We don't need too many hashtags, but no. pass the mic could be a thing. Um, okay, so here's the deal. Frank Loveson is the founder of Friesen Brothers. All right, this guy is an Alberta business legend. Like he's in the Alberta Business Hall of Fame. He's an officer of the Order of Canada. Uh, he has has owned and operated this. He doesn't, your mic's hot, Sam, just so you know. Um, we're all hearing you enjoy that coffee. You maybe want to bring your mic down. There you go. See, it's just, see, now, because if you don't have a coffee, you're listening to Sam sipping at like 50 decibels, and you're, now you, all you can think about is getting your own coffee. So Frank Loveson is, is basically like a, a pillar of Alberta's business community. 
And when they talk about, like, if you walk into a free, this isn't an ad, by the way. This is just me talking. About to read you an awesome letter from Frank. Uh, in his 80s, still sharp as hell, still shows up to work every single day. Like, this guy, you, I hope you can feel through the microphone, through your speakers, how I feel about Frank Loveson, how much I respect him. Uh, so he is keeping an eye on business, obviously, and the business landscape, including the Canada Emergency Wage subsidy, right, that employers were able to tap into. And he's irked. But if you know Frank, he keeps it classy. He's a very understated fella. Like he's not, I don't want to step too far into this, but let me just, he's not the guy that, even though he could, he's not the guy that like rolls around in a Bentley with like, you know, $700 sunglasses and, you know, the a, a coat made out of some animal that's super rare from some country we've never heard of. That's not his style. We all know those folks. They've, they've tasted success and it's so obvious everywhere they go. This guy's a picture of humility. And the way he runs his business is, is really impressive. And I think you could take his business principles and apply them to a bunch of different businesses and say we should be so lucky to have this type of ethical perspective when it comes to our business. Let me get to Frank's letter from Frank Loveson in Stony Plain, Alberta. He says, we have been, Friesen Brothers, we have been a free enterprise company for more than 65 years. I was there when I didn't take a paycheck because there were no funds to cover my wage. I received the banker's phone call to ask if I was making a deposit today. My partners and I started a business when our only financial institution was a finance company charging 50% more interest than the banks who were lending at 6%. We also navigated the 20% interest in the latter 70s and early 80s without any bankruptcies. We worked hard we paid our taxes, we delayed our gratification, and we did business ethically. I'm embarrassed, says Frank Loveson, and deeply disturbed to see a government program that was assigned to help small businesses and their employees survive a pandemic being abused by some of the largest companies in Canada. Why did the large companies apply for the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy? CEWS. It saddens me, he says, to see companies like Imperial Oil receive $120 million from the program and then pay out a dividend of $324 million. Finning received $95 million and paid out $68 million in dividends. Accor Group, Leon's Furniture, Pambina Pipeline, Chorus Entertainment, North American Construction, and Morgard Corporation all paid dividends after receiving the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. What disturbs me, says Mr. Loveson, is the lack of integrity and foresight the boards of these companies had when they considered the ramifications of their decisions. Who are the leaders of business in Canada? Are we waiting for the workers to revolt and show management the way? Or is big business going to take the responsibility for ethical leadership based on moral principles? Remember, we don't take advantage of dumb politicians because in the end, every one of us will pay an enormous price. That from Frank Loveson, founder of Friesen Brothers, officer of the Order of Canada, out of Stony Plain, Alberta. I thought that was a phenomenal point that he made. And, and Frank, I talked to him on the phone yesterday. He was We invited him to come on the program, obviously. Uh, he wasn't able to make it today, but he sends his best wishes to the Real Talk audience. He, he blessed us in reading this. Uh, he gave us permission to read this. He said, you know, these aren't numbers that I'm pulling out. Of. I said, you're calling out some big businesses here. He goes, well, the numbers don't lie. He says, these are numbers that are readily available. These are numbers that have been uh, published in the Financial Post. He says, people need to be talking about this. I think it is absolutely, uh, I love this from uh, Joe and Lacombe writes in, he says, here, here. He says, thanks, Frank. It looks like I'm a Friesen Brothers fan now. I mean, that's part of the part, and I know this is going to start like a big, sound like a big commercial. Uh, that's part of the reason why I'm so proud to partner with this company is a perspective like that. That's disgusting, though. I mean, if you really think about it, you can imagine the conversations around these boardroom tables. Do we need the Canada emergency wage subsidy? I mean, not really, but everyone's taking it. Well, we should probably take it, right? 
We should probably get our hands on this cash. Paying out dividends after me is deplorable. It, yeah. Well, I, and like, okay, fine. So at their year-end filings, they should have it all clawed back. Like, if, they, if they're posting dividends and they've claimed the wage subsidy, like, to me, that's just like, all right, you've, you've shown your books. You've shown your numbers. You've shown that uh, clearly – you had a good year. Let's uh, let's let's claw all of that money back in in your tax filings because uh, either that or like you know as soon as you apply for the wage subsidy, you have to open your books. I don't have a problem with that. I I think that we absolutely need to be giving the businesses that need it the support to get through this. Yeah. But the abuse is disgusting. Scott says uh, socialism is not good uh, unless it's for corporations. Am I right, <laughs> Scott? <laughs> I like that. Another says, D. Flange says, I know of companies purposefully, uh, purposely bidding projects at a loss because they could use the financial aid to bring it back to a profit. Can you believe it? I mean, you know, uh, what about this from Judy who says, look at this, all the Trudeau bashers lined up at the trough. Isn't that the case, Judy? Unbelievable. The comments here, the comments speak for themselves, and you can read those comments. By the way, even if you're watching this or listening to this later in the day, we recognize that many of you, as a matter of fact, the lion's share. Like, numbers-wise, 85 to 90% of you take in Real Talk outside of our live morning hours. We do this live because we're going to bring you live broadcasts. We know many of you make this your appointment in the mornings. It's our appointment, too, and we love it, and we're always going to be live. But many of you are listening later in the day. If you're listening to the podcast, we wanted to let you know that if you instead watch via our YouTube channel, if you watch the broadcast, watch our show later in the day, you can read the comments as they were coming in as the show was airing at that time, which is a pretty cool feature to have. Let's get to another letter, and you can let me know what you think. Allison wrote in. Uh, Allison says, hey, I wanted to thank you, uh, you and your brother, Kyle, uh, what you're doing to to educate people with regards to to drug use and Vancouver's homeless population. We, we've spent over the last few weeks uh, some time talking to yeah, my brother, Kyle, who works at Insight in Vancouver, Nathaniel Erskine Smith, the member of parliament who's been looking into out of his riding in Ontario, looking into decriminalizing or legalizing narcotics and the science behind that. We talked to Garth Mullins of the Crackdown Pod. Uh, just a remarkable guy. Uh, we've we've talked to Dr. Elaine Hishka, Dr. Hakik Varani about addictions issues and treatment for people who use drugs. We've we've really put some meaningful effort into you know I mean the pandemic, uh, and, and then the other epidemic, the health epidemic that is the opioid crisis. You know more people are going to die from more people have died this year uh, from opioid overdoses, fentanyl overdoses in Alberta than COVID by a couple hundred. And the same trend tragically holds true in provinces across Canada, Saskatchewan, B.C. included. Allison says, I was in Vancouver in November visiting uh, my daughter who's working at St. Paul's. That's the medical epicenter for, for the homeless and for substance use treatment. And uh, I was living in the heart of the West End. And while there, I was approached by a panhandler who I recognized from Edmonton, says Allison. Then I passed an elderly woman who was asleep in a nest of blankets on the pavement on the corner. Her wheelchair pushed off to the side. Her hand was clenched outside the nest. I put five bucks into it and I walked on. I'm I'm still wondering. I don't know. She says whether I caused her more harm than good. Did it did it blow away? Did somebody hurt her taking it from her? Uh, you know, or did she finally have it when she woke up and was able to get breakfast the next morning? Allison says you can tell Allison's thoughtful. She says, on another day, I was driving down East Hastings in the morning past blocks and blocks and, and blocks of homeless people, young and old, some in tents, some on the ground. She says, there are two things that I took with me. I learned that many homeless people have moved to Vancouver from other provinces, which makes it truly our problem, too. Kyle said that. You remember he looked in the camera talking to Alberta's politicians, and he said, we are doing your work for you here, as Alberta politicians disdainfully dismiss downtown east side vancouver she said the other thing once you see this you can't unsee it which finally leads me says allison to what i wanted to share with your audience she said i went online the other day to make a donation to covenant house that's one of the charities that work with this population in vancouver and, and she said and i actually realized that until december 31st all donations to covenant house will be tripled by a few sponsors, including actors Ryan Reynolds, of course, from Vancouver, and Blake Lively. 
She says, I realize there are other groups in Vancouver doing good work and that they deserve recognition as well. But perhaps you might do a shout out to this particular campaign. Allison says, I'm really enjoying the diversity in the show. Thank you. That from Allison. Allison, these are the types of emails that we just we cherish. Uh, you, you, you're 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 making your way through your week and you're processing thoughts. You're chewing on things that you've heard here on Real Talk and you're applying them to your life experiences and you're taking action and you're calling us out and putting a challenge in front of us. And I adore that. So donations to Covenant House in Vancouver. You're watching us from British Columbia. No, about 10% of you are. And we're going to grow that number. Vancouver's Covenant host could use your donations, and up until the end of the year, they'll be tripled. Your donation will be tripled. How great is that? By sponsors, including Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively. Allison, thanks for your email. You can send us an email anytime at talk at ryanjesperson.com. You know, we keep an eye on our hashtag as well, and we'll be getting to some of those. Real Talk RJ is powered by the team at Park Power. And they've got an amazing promotion on right now. Did you hear about this promotion at Park Power, Sam? Have you heard about this? I have not. This is amazing. Let's, uh, let's, let's hear it. You know, there's a new promo for listeners and viewers of Real Talk. So here's the deal. We've been telling you parkpower.ca, electricity, natural gas, and internet, right? They're local. They employ local people in their call centers, and they profit share with local charities. So what other reason do you need? You go, well, what's in it for me? I'll tell you what. Right now, when a home or business signs up with Park Power and you enter the promo code 2021-REALTALK, the promo code 2021-REALTALK, you will receive $70 off your first bill. How great is that? How great is that? I could use $70 off my power bill. That's Chris and the team at Park Power. They reached out to us. They're blown away by the early response from you, our Real Talk audience. So if you're either a residential or a business scenario that's looking for electricity, natural gas, or internet, make sure you enter the promo code when you sign up at parkpower.ca, 2021-REALTALK. You'll receive $70 off your first bill. I love it. Sam, before we get to our uh, lead-off guest this morning, why don't we take a look at the stories that are making news today? Well, we're doing our best to keep you up to speed in the context of Christmas travel and COVID-19. Wanted to let you know that word has gone out in the province of Alberta. Anybody that's recently traveled from the UK is being asked to get tested for COVID-19, whether or not you're showing symptoms. Uh, Dr. Dina Hinshaw saying yesterday, Alberta's chief medical officer of health, all travelers coming to Alberta from the UK will be contacted, offered an appointment to get tested. Please accept that appointment. Uh, Anybody who enters Canada now must self-isolate for 14 days unless they are participating in that rapid testing pilot program that launched in Edmonton. It's going down in Calgary as well. Uh, Dr. Dina Hinshaw saying travelers who have arrived in the past 14 days and have participated in the program must isolate immediately meantime we're taking a look at that the the uh what are they calling it? the evolution of this virus that new strain that people are noticing and, and, and wondering about vaccine efficacy well a spokesperson for biontech the chief executive Ugar Sain, who worked with pfizer in developing this said we don't know at the moment if our vaccine is also able to provide protection against this new variant but because the proteins on the variant, I know that we're getting out of our depth here a little bit, those of us non-virologists, but the protein on the variant are 99% the same as prevailing strains. So the official word from BioNTech, who developed this vaccine, is that they have scientific confidence in that vaccine. Uh, our vaccine coverage will continue into the new year, of course. Uh, wanted to update you. You know, we had talked about uh, Dr. Darren Markland and myself getting vaccinated together on the air. You remember that? He was one of the very first guests the very first week that we were on air. He's an ICU physician at the Royal Alexandra Hospital. Wanted to update you. Alberta Health Services has been great in working with us, their media team included. And we've come to a conclusion, which is the only conclusion to reach, was that Dr. Markland needs his vaccine immediately. Uh, Dr. Marklin will not be here in studio with us as a cohort, and I cannot get vaccinated at the same time that medical professionals are getting vaccinated and ahead of the general public because that would look really, 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 really bad. So here's the deal. To set a good example, when the vaccine is publicly available, I'm going to get vaccinated on the air. 
In the meantime, Dr. Marklin is vaccinated and healthy and ready to go, uh, along with all the other frontline healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses, the respiratory techs, the administrators, and everybody else, the paramedics that continue to serve us, the firefighters, the police officers, and the list goes on each and every day, and we're so grateful for them. Let's get to our first guest. Uh, very much looking forward to this conversation. You know, we talked last week with uh, uh, a couple of guests, uh, including Ann Castleman from The Walrus. Uh, and then, of course, Heidi had joined us as well with this uh, amazing petition that she had put forward. It's all about a universal child care program or nationally funded, nationally organized child care program. Wow. Rocky Pancholi, the MLA out of Edmonton White Mud, is the official opposition critic for children's services. And this is all over her radar. And we're grateful that you reached out to the program, making your Real Talk debut this morning. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here. I have to say uh, uh, con congratulations to you. Let me add my voice to the thousands of Canadians who are excited about what you're doing here. And uh, I've been watching the show uh, religiously. And I have to say you've had such a fantastic uh, variety of guests and it's been awesome to have your voice back. Well, we really, uh, I appreciate that personally. And thank you so much. It's been, it's been a wild. I mean, this is, uh, we're into our fifth week of shows, which is kind of blowing our mind that this has all happened so quickly. We're kind of looking around us going, what is going on right now? But it's an exciting thing to see the audience so engaged already. Um, you, I feel like in the introduction, you know, we talk, you know, you're an MLA and, and here's your portfolio. Here's your, your critics, your shadow ministry, whatever we want to call it. But maybe more importantly than that, in the context of what we're talking about, maybe we should also clarify, you're a mom. <laughs> I'm a mom who currently has my bedroom door locked so that the two children don't barge in during this interview. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Like, you know, I, I tell people all the time before I ran for office in 2019, I actually wasn't very politically active in those four years while the NDP were in government because I was in the thick of being a mom. Uh, my daughter, my youngest child was born 10 days after the 2015 provincial election. And I was in the thick of maternity leave. Then I had a toddler and a baby baby and I was back at work full time. And guess what? I was uh, heavily reliant upon childcare. And so uh, those four years, I was, I was like so many other working parents out there just trying to uh, continue on with my work and my profession, but also make sure that my children had uh, fantastic uh, care and, and uh, early learning opportunities. And that's what I was doing. And so uh, certainly I come at this position of critic for children's services uh, and uh, you know, an advocate of childcare very honestly, because it's been my lived experience. It's been my experience uh, of so many other parents and, and, and women in my in my groups and my fa friends, families, colleagues. Um, so yeah, it comes to me pretty honestly. And certainly during the pandemic, uh, this whole time, I was like every other parent when childcare and schools were shut down in the, in the spring, I still had to figure out how to do work when I had uh, kids at home who were getting way too much screen time. <laughs> so, you know, I, I feel like I, I've lived this pretty sincerely and I understand uh, a lot of what parents are experiencing right now. So, Racky, we, we, you know, we talked to um, Heidi Bergstrom was on the show. She's an accountant out of central Alberta. She's a mom, too. And so yeah. she brought us her perspective. She's one of the organizers. She's the organizer of this petition uh, sending to the federal government calling for, for a, a national, uh, a federally organized and funded. And, and we need to clarify those details because they're relevant. Yeah. Um, um, she, mm -hmm. they, they don't. She and Ann Castleman, the journalist from the Walrus, uh, both of them joined us on the same day. Both of them moms as well, but coming at this from different positions. They both clarified that that they're not necessarily looking for Ottawa to simply strike checks to people. They don't want everyone to just receive some sort of a subsidy to cover daycare because they said things like accessibility, availability to childcare programs aren't a reality for everybody. There's different cost structures depending on where you live, urban, rural, which province you're in. So you're, you know, you as a, a provincial elected representative uh, out of Edmonton, White Mud, why don't we start big picture with what you think would work and what you think a provincial government should do uh, in the context of what would quite likely be a federally funded or a federally organized program. Take us into how you would cook it up. So first of all, let me say, I loved listening to that interview with uh, with Ann Castleman and Heidi Bergstrom. Heidi and I had actually met before to talk about childcare uh, a few months ago. And uh, when I was listening to that interview with Ann in particular, I was running on the treadmill at the time and I kept like raising my fist and going, yes, yes, after so many points she made and I nearly fell off the treadmill at least twice. Um, but it, because those issues were like, she, they nailed it, right? They nailed the issues which are about affordability, about accessibility, but also about quality. 
And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy, like uh, I think a lot of uh, Canadians are to hear our federal government talking about a national child care program. It is about 50 years in the making. And I think uh, many early learning advocates will say they've been hearing this talk for decades. So I think there's a lot of questions about, okay, we've heard this talk, let's make sure something happens. But the important part for me as a provincial uh, elected representative is to highlight something that Anne actually mentioned, which is that Childcare and early learning is actually a provincial responsibility. It is part of the province's responsibility around education. And that's really key because my concern right now, uh, watching what our current provincial government has been doing uh, to childcare and early learning is uh, I'm reluctant to let the province off the hook for their responsibility to make sure that Alberta's children have equal um, uh, and quality access to early learning opportunities. Because that's currently what we're seeing. This, the province um, has been undercutting uh, early learning and childcare since they were elected in 2019. Uh, and they've done that repeatedly uh, in a number of different ways that continued on even when the pandemic hit, when most Canadians and most working parents and economists, banks, the chambers of commerce were all saying, hey, now is the time we really need to focus on childcare. The current provincial government proceeded to go forward with cuts to um, grants to childcare operators to end the $25 per day childcare program, um, to roll back and eliminate uh, provincial uh, quality standards for childcare. So not only is childcare a pressing need right now to, for Albertans and Canadians, um, but they've actually, we're now dealing with a system that is in worse condition than it was before uh, because of the UCP government's uh, approach. So. Thanks for your question about what will we do, because I'm pretty excited about this. It's something I've spent a lot of time uh, reading about, and I'm a bit of a policy geek, and I love to read stuff, and I've and every article that's come across, I've been uh, immersed in it. And one of the things that we believe as the official opposition is, yeah, we're here to hold the government to account, and uh, and I'm certainly doing my best to do that, but we also need to be showing that there are alternatives and, and proposals for how we should be dealing with early learning and child care. So as part of our Alberta's Future initiative, this is something that's been rolled out by the NDP official opposition is to talk about an economic strategy for Alberta going forward that we want input and engagement from all Albertans on. And I mean all Albertans. Like, Ryan, this is the part that I'm really most proud of. We're not just trying to talk to our echo chamber, right? We know that that, that, that exists out there. We're trying to engage people who might even consider themselves conservatives and say, look, let's talk about an economic strategy to how to get us back on track. And repeatedly, what we're hearing from all those groups I talked about, banks, chambers of commerce, economists, is childcare needs to be up front. And why that is because we need to get Albertans back to work. And so we've rolled out an, uh, a child care proposal on albertasfuture.ca. I really encourage everybody to take a look at it. It is truly an engagement and consultation. This is not one of those situations where we see that government, you know, they often do this. They've already made up their mind about what they want to do and they put it out there. We're actually engaging. And we're talking about, yeah, you know what, Ryan, this is a this is one that I know that the UCP hates, but we're going to keep talking about it. We are talking about $25 per day childcare across the province, um, universal, affordable, quality childcare. Do you and think when you take a look the, back, Racky, at the at the $25 a day pilot program that that the NDP had rolled out uh, while in government, what flaws? What would you change about it? What did you know flaws wise? We get we get messages. I read one on the air, uh, I guess about five shows ago, where someone said, you know, we, we know people of modest incomes that lost their funding there, and there are people that I mean, they're speculating. I think. But they're saying, you know, there are people with a combined household income of 300 grand that are still receiving the $25 a day child care. They didn't feel like that, that, that it was an equitable program. Yeah, and I think that's probably the biggest critique of the 25 day, day pilot program was that it was a pilot. Um, you know, the, the issue was that it was only rolled out in 122 centers to begin with, because it's a massive program, right? It is, it's a, it's no, it's not just affordable programming. It's about quality programming. So there was, you know, funding for professional development, wage top ups, uh, ch early childhood curriculum. It was a huge endeavor. And so it was rolled out as 122 sites to begin with, uh, across the province. Let me note about half of those, uh, those programs were actually in rural Alberta outside of Edmonton and Calgary. Um, and. And uh, I think the, the major critique that I've heard repeatedly was it just wasn't fair because not everybody had access to it. So my response to that is if, if the concern is that not everybody had access to it, let's make sure that everybody has access to it. 
like the UCP's response to the fact that not everybody could get this affordable quality childcare program was to eliminate it. So nobody has access to it. And that's frankly backwards. Um, so you know, like the thing is, we, we talk about universal ed childcare and people say, well, should parents who make, you know, $300,000 per year have access to affordable childcare? The answer is yes, actually, because it's about universality. We don't income test for education. We don't income test for healthcare. We realize that kids start to learn uh, in those critical early years, long before they walk through the doors of a school. So why would we say all kids should have access to quality learning when they're six and they start grade one, when we know that those critical years of zero to five are actually the years where we should make sure all kids have access to, to quality yeah. care? I, now, think, uh, so I think we should income test on health care, by the way. I think we should bring back health care premiums for, for anybody that earns more than a certain threshold. This is a, a curveball to throw your way, and, and the opposition health critics should probably take that one. But, but let me just throw that in. I don't have a problem, actually, with structuring things based on income. I think that the, the, the lowest income earners need to have the biggest supports because I, I think you would probably agree with me, and we can debate this all day long, um, but you would probably agree with me that a lot of times single parents – um, disproportionately, I think women are precluded from entering the workforce because of the lack of affordable child care. And that probably is more characteristic of people in a lower income earning scenario. Would you agree? Oh, that is absolutely the case. It's 100% the case that we know that um, that lower income families are more likely to choose. Uh, and and I, I use the word choose really light. Like yeah. that's actually not true. It's not a choice, right? So we know that low income families are more likely to go into unlicensed childcare situations, right? Where it's informal, there's no regulation, there's no health and safety rules, nothing like that. In like really informal, like they might go to work and be like, okay, who's going to watch my kid today for eight hours? Um, and it's, it's, it, that is much more likely for low income families. Uh, it's much more likely in rural settings, frankly, where they don't have a lot of licensed programming. So for sure there, there are inequities, right? And that's why this idea of thinking about childcare, about choice is, is a false premise. And we hear that all the time from, uh, from the current government. We hear that from conservative governments quite often. We want to support parents' choice, which is why we want to put more money in parents' pockets to make choice, right? To choose where they're going to put their kids. But the reality is that we have far fewer spaces, licensed spaces available for kids, and there are young kids in this in this province. We don't have them equitably spread around the province. Um, most parents, even if they can, you know, if you're in Edmonton, maybe you find a great center, but there's a wait list that's two or three or four years long. You might never get your kid in. And so the reality, there is no choice. Um, parents, I would love to say, you know, I like, I, I want to be really clear. There are parents who absolutely would like to choose to have one parent stay home with their kids when they're young. And that is great if that is truly a choice. But the reality is that most parents, and we know this, the stats show it, 50% of parents say they, the reason they can't access childcare is because they can't afford it. And let's be clear about, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I was, I was just, to talk there. well, I was just, I was just going to jump in. I mean, sometimes all my job is just to be the voice of the people that are watching right now. Um, I'm intrigued. Uh, Dono Loburn is, is uh, listening in and don't off the top of my head. I hope I don't blow this, but I think he was president of a constituency, a, a progressive conservative constituency association back in the day and engaged uh, conservative. And he says, Racky Pancholi is why the NDP, you're not expecting this one, Racky, I guarantee it. Uh, he says, Racky is why the NDP is so attractive to true fiscal conservatives as supporting the, see, look, you're surprised. He says, as supporting the economy means getting everyone back to work. Everyone, he goes on to say that everyone, that's the word he keeps using, everyone working means a strong economy and strong government revenue. There is... I mean, you know, people will always have their own, you know, what did, uh, what did uh, Kellyanne Conway say? I think it was like alternative facts or something. <laughs> people have their alternative facts. But the fact is that there are fiscal arguments to be made. I mean, I was just, before I talked to you, let me go on a bit of a tangent. I promise I'll bring it back. But we were talking about supervised consumption services. We've been talking about homeless support, supports for people who use drugs. We've been talking about that a lot on the show. Uh, we're on pace to lose a thousand Albertans to opioid overdoses this year. And there is a fiscal case. There's a bottom line argument to be made for supervised consumption. It costs a society. And this is so callous and horrible to put it this way, because when I say it costs a society less, the true cost here that we're talking about is the loss of human life. Let's be very clear. 
However, when it comes to, you know, dollars and cents, we spend less as a society operating supervised consumption services and providing health avenues for people than we do responding to overdoses in back alleys. I mean, that's just a there's a fiscal argument to be made. If you're not swayed by the loss of human life or preventing the loss of human life, at least be swayed by the dollar amount or the dollar argument, the fiscal argument. There's the same, I think, to be made. Every expert that I've spoken with, I have yet to talk to a PhD or some executive director of some national organization, Racky, that has any insight on child care that argues against providing funding for child care so people can enter the workforce and da 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 pay taxes, right? A hundred percent right. Like that's you know, and I think Anne's uh her article in the walrus nailed it. It's like there are very few silver bullets in terms of, of economic policy more than there is childcare, early learning and childcare, because for exactly the same uh, ideas that you just talked about when it comes to supervised consumption, there are long-term economic benefits. There are immediate economic benefits. There are absolutely no downside. The biggest downside is that, yeah, it does, it does require a, a significant commitment and investment of dollars right now. And it, nobody's shying away from the, uh, from the realities that investing in a true universal affordable quality early learning and childcare system takes some dollars. Like, and, and I'm not gonna shy away from that either. But if we're gonna talk about smart economic investments, if we're gonna talk about guaranteed return on investment, it's early learning and childcare. It gets women back to work. And let's, you know, let's be clear. I know there's lots of parents. It's not just women. It's a generalization, but it's also based in fact. We know that when there is a parent that needs to stay home, it's going to be the lower wage earner, which is unfortunately still the reality. It is women. We know we got to talk about the pandemic here, Ryan, too, because the pandemic has had a huge impact on women's participation in the workforce, like absolutely like setting us back decades, right? Because, and I'm sure you know women in your friend circles, I know women in my circles, and I hear about it all the time, women who have rolled back their hours, women who have left the workforce because they don't have childcare or they're doing online learning with their kids right now. And that's only getting worse, right? So we want, and whether or not this is not really honestly an equitable argument, if you don't believe in the equity of everybody should get back to work and we should maybe it, both parents parents, men and women, you still have to acknowledge that for our economy to function, you can't exclude 51% of the population. Yeah. You can't say that their participation in the workforce is irrelevant. You got to get them back to work. And that requires early learning uh, and childcare. And of course, the investment in the kids, which like, again, that, that should go without saying, but you save money by the fact that they have fewer health interventions, fewer educational investments, I I interventions, fewer, they say, criminal uh, interventions later on. Like it, it is a no brainer. It really is. It's uh, we're talking to Racky Pancholi, MLA out of Edmonton, White Mud. Heidi Bergstrom's actually watching right now, and she's hey, and she's fact checking on our YouTube comment thread. She's like she's like our fact checker this morning, which is amazing. A uh, good morning to Heidi. Heidi's the one that got this conversation started on this show. Uh, she, as an engaged citizen, is is making a huge impact. L let me let me you know put something in front of you here, and and I see a lot of this, Joseph for example, says, I'm all for helping out single parents. He says, moms and dads with daycare. But how about we encourage people to stay home? I hear this all the time, Rocky. You probably do too. How about we encourage people to stay home and raise their own kids? He says, I don't care if it's mom or dad staying home, but this is going to piss a lot of people off. But putting kids in daycare and having a daycare raise your kids is wrong. That from Joseph. So, you know, I have a couple of responses to that, Ryan. First of all, uh, you know, I, <laughs> first of all, let me say, I am raising my kids, right? Kids who uh, <laughs> parents who are putting, are using early learning and childcare, they're raising their kids. Uh, just like you don't stop raising your kids when they start school. You're still their parent and you're still absolutely their parent. Second of all, you know, the, the comment of, you know, I, I'm all for helping out kids. No, it's not, you're not doing us a favor necessarily. This is not charity by supporting early learning and childcare. Our kids grow up to be members of our society. They're citizens, right? We acknowledge that when they start, when they turn age six and they go to school, why do we care as a society? Why do we invest in their education? Because guess what? They're going to grow up and they're going to be adults and they're going to be working and they're going to be maybe your doctor. They're going to maybe be your lawyer. They're going to be uh, the person driving the truck, delivering the food to your house. Like they're those, these are active members of our society. Kids are, you're not doing anybody a favor you're not helping them out. It's not charity to support early learning and childcare. You're investing in our society and in our kids, and those kids are going to grow up and take care of you. Um, and so, you know, I, I like 
honestly, and that, that idea that a parent should stay home, hey, we're not in the 1950s anymore. Like, honestly, like that rhetoric, whenever I hear that, it's, it's, it's calling back to a time when I look around this world and that's not the world we live in right now. Most I've, parents can't stay home that way. Well, right? and I have, and I have, I have a lot of ideas on how people should live their lives, but it, but it, <laughs> but it would make for lousy public policy. Uh, that's not, that's not, <laughs> I don't know, really that could the, be really interesting to see Ryan. I yeah. Don't well, know. <laughs> maybe I'll do, maybe I'll do a list of like my own 10 commandments and I'll just, I'll just bring them down from the mountain someday and I'll tell everybody yeah. how I think they should be living. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, we see probably also another common, you know, I, I worked in door to door sales one summer, Racky, and they taught me at sales school that the number one thing I needed to do was be able to identify objections and answer the objections. And, and mm -hmm. you take that through life. It's actually great advice. So so there's one objection that you've just answered. Another common objection that I see is what about the families that have sacrificed People want to say, hey, listen, we could have had both parents working outside the home. We, you know, either I worked or my, my spouse worked, you know, two jobs to make sure that we could keep the lights on. And I'm not I'm not uh, being facetious. I'm not mocking. I being, you know, this is amazing. People that do this good for them. That's great. That's what they've decided is good for their family. But they'll say we made the sacrifices so we could have a parent home with the kids. That was important to us. So why how are we going to be treated fairly under this structure? You know, whether it's a tax credit or something else, what would you propose? Well, you know, and I think that's a fair question. And, mm -hmm. and what I, I first come back to the idea of um, as long as that's a true choice, right? Like as and I think there are parents who truly want to choose to stay home and, and they, they make that decision based on what their values are, what their what their income is. And that's great. I think that they should have that choice. Um, but I also think that we are part of a collective society here. And, um, and we do want to make sure that all all kids have a, who whose parents choose to have access. Well, let's be clear, we're not talking about mandatory early learning and childcare, right? We're talking about universal and accessible childcare. Um, so that's a choice. Um, and so I think there already are tax credits and there and there should be more. Like when I talk about early learning and childcare, it needs to be um, a multi-pronged strategy, right? We need to have accessibility and affordability in terms of putting more money in the pockets for, um, for low-income families through subsidies. We need to make sure that we cut the costs of programming directly to the operator so that they can afford to provide quality programming. And yes, tax credits, it's part of that as well. Like, I think you need to look at a full approach. Um, and for parents who do make those choices, there were supports that were in place, actually, that the current UCP government cut. Like they cut uh, abilities for um, parents to choose to place their kids in what would they call kin care. So like if you wanted to use a family member to help you out for childcare now and then, even if you chose to stay home with your, your kids, but sometimes you needed help from a family member, they cut that support. Um, they cut the support for stay at home parents who wanted to send their kids to preschool, um, you know, for two or three hours a week or a day. Um, that was support that was again, to help those families who had chosen to stay home with their kids um, and, but still wanted to have access to some preschool early learning opportunities. The UCP government cut that as well. So there has to be uh, lots of options available, but we really truly need to make sure that they are options because right now too many Alberta families are making choices about staying out of the workforce because they don't have choice because they can't afford it because they can't find a space and they can't find a space that meets their needs okay let me ask you this uh congratulations by the way the listeners of one of the podcasts that i really enjoy the dave berta podcast uh, which is put out there by by dave cornway and his team uh, they do an amazing job covering alberta politics western canadian politics uh the listeners uh, the subscribers of the dave berta podcast have named you uh the up-and-coming mla to watch in 2021 so congratulations on that. Here is my question to wrap. What will you do as the up and coming MLA to watch in 2021 in opposition to work with the current government to impact change in some of the areas that we've discussed today? Well, that's a great question. Now, I do think that there's always two parts of that relationship, right? And I do hope that the government's also open to hearing about it. Um, and it is challenging in opposition, I'll say that. Uh, and I'm new to this and I'm watching it. And it's a little frustrating because, uh, you know, the government hasn't brought us into uh, a lot of the conversations that I think typically governments have done with their opposition members. They don't brief us. They don't invite us. And, and during the pandemic, we haven't heard a lot of what's been going on. So, uh, you know, uh, what I can tell you is I've actually already um, had the opportunity to work 
with a number of UCP MLAs, and I'm going to continue to do that and show openness to talk about, you know, I'm talking about childcare a lot, Ryan. It's no secret. It's something I'm passionate about, I care about. And I think that that's actually resonating with, uh, with some members of, of the government as well. And, uh, and I've actually been having those conversations with, with uh, government members who are interested in talking about childcare. And I want to actually hear their input as well. Like when I talk about this childcare proposal that we're doing as part of Alberta's future, we're doing it on hydrogen, geothermal, all that tech. We got to take all these ideas. We want to work with them for sure, but they also need to be able to work with us. But I want to hear ideas from all Albertans. I am not, and this is this is one of the things I can tell you uh, I'm very passionate about. I am not interested in just talking to people who already agree with me. That does not help Albertans. It doesn't help uh, the policy. I want to develop uh, alternatives that really reflect the diversity of people's needs. One of the things I'm focusing on right now, and I'm an Edmonton white mud MLA, like this is Southwest Edmonton. Um, I'm talking to a lot of rural areas right now because when we talk about childcare, that they're the areas that are being hit the hardest right now. So that's important to me. That's important to me to hear from all Albertans. So I'm going to keep doing that. I, I would love to have more conversations. I, I'm trying to work on a more amicable relationship with the Minister for Children's Services. I think we're doing some good, we've made some good progress on that. Uh, do you guys communicate, you too? Do you, you communicate yeah, with Absolutely. Minister Schultz? Yeah. Yep. No, we do. Absolutely. Um, she's been very responsive. I sent her emails. Not everything is a political hit, right, Ryan? <laughs> like there are certain things that we need to get some changes done. And I, you know, I emailed her and she's very responsive and we do have those conversations and, uh, and I really value that. And I appreciate that from her. And uh, we're going to keep doing that because that is ultimately I'm here to get great government policy that reflects and supports the Alberta of the future that we all care about. That's what I'm here to do. So there's different ways to do that. There's political ways, there's backroom ways, there's conversations with constituents. It, it's all part of the job. Uh, you know, uh, from the up and coming MLA to watch in 2021, Racky Pancholi, the interview being viewed by the best Alberta MLA of 2020. <laughs> Per the subscribers yeah. of the Dave Berta podcast, Janice Irwin says, I love the heat you're bringing, Rocky. So there you go. <laughs> hey, thanks for this. A happy holidays uh, to you and your family. And we'll look forward to future conversations. And of course, uh, I know I don't have to do this, but I'll invite you to continue to stay in touch with the show. If there's anything that you think that our viewers, that our listeners need to know about, we'll be happy to pass that information along. You know, this is a this is an engaged audience on this subject. I probably don't have to tell you that. Mm hmm. Well, I love it. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate you uh, having these conversations. Childcare is something that's something that falls off the radar. So I really appreciate you giving it a platform. And uh, happy holidays to you and your family. Stay safe and stay healthy. You got it. That's Racky Pancholi. She's the uh, MLA out of Edmonton White Mud, and she's the official opposition critic for Children's Services. We appreciate her availability. You know, we, we talk about these types of things because you put them in front of us. Uh, this is this is a show where we want to have real talk, meaningful talk about issue. I think off the top of my head, Cam Rose, uh, she reached out and she was like, hey, guys, like I'm doing this. I'm an accountant and I've crunched some numbers on a national child care program. And I'm a mom, a young mom. And and I wondered if you might want to talk about this. And we went, might we want to talk about it? So we started talking about it. Just so happened that Ann Castleman was doing a great piece in the Walrus right around this time. So we reached out to her, had, had a great uh, back and forth between those two. Racky reaches out, says, we'd love to talk about what we're doing on this file. And now a whole bunch of you, a whole bunch of you are, are telling us about your reality, about your situation. This is how the content develops. And another big way that that content develops, another big way that we build a robust understanding of what you care about and how you feel about issues is through our Y Station Real Talk panel. Uh, Chris Henderson was on yesterday talking about this, and I just want to put it on your radar one more time. If you visit ryanjesperson.com and you right on the very top bar, you'll see our question of the week. It's where we invite you to get real, so to speak. And, and we ask you to answer a question each and every week that, that takes, I don't know what it'll take you, you know, between 90 seconds and four minutes, depending on how much time you put into it. It's not too huge of a commitment, but what it does is it gives us hundreds, literally hundreds, we're over 500 now, uh, of responses that, that allow us to gauge where you're at on issues like how was your holiday shopping uh, changed by COVID? Or the question this week uh, is an amazing one. And we're, we're going to be getting into that, uh, obviously, once we're through the week and we have all the responses early next week on ultimately the impact of COVID-19 on you. As you look back through the pandemic, the impact of this year on you. So go to RyanJesperson.com, click on question of the week. And thanks to those of you, you know, you hear they'll say, um, 
you know, a, a, a broadcast outlet will say, you know, we have exclusive polling from Ipsos or from Angus Reid or exclusive polling from uh, Main Street Research or whatever, right? And they'll say, you know, they'll roll it out, these big broadcast outlets, and they'll say, you know, we had 1,000 respondents to this survey, or we polled 1,500 Canadians. And people go, that's a pretty good cross-section, right? Two weeks in, we're at over 500, okay? So this is, this is the little show that could, right? And so here we are. We've got this Real Talk panel of people that are from the far left all the way over to the far right on the spectrum, people that live in rural situations, urban situations, young and old, from different backgrounds, different sexual orientations, different ethnic backgrounds, different religious convictions, all of you chiming in to give us a real clear sense of what the real talk audience feels about issues that matter. That drives our content. That allows us to make informed decisions. And it also gives us a really clear picture of who is watching and listening to this show, which is very exciting stuff. So we encourage you to participate in that. Uh, So the question of the week, what impact did 2020 ultimately have on you? And we're seeing some early results on our dashboard. No surprise that a lot of you are talking about your mental health. And we appreciate when you expand your answers and really get into it. It gives us a lot of, a lot to work with. And so next Monday on the show, we'll be getting into the responses from this week's question of the week. And then, of course, we'll roll out our next question of the week as well. Before we get to our next interview, wanted to remind you how we breathe easiest, and that is because of our partnership here with Clean Air Club. And I'm thrilled to see so many of you signing up. You're letting me know on Twitter. You're 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 tagging Real Talk, and you're letting me know that you're signing up to be part of this furnace filter thing they've got going on, which just makes life so easy. You know, we breathe day in and day out. You go, tell us something we don't know, Jesperson. You're not exactly Captain Profound today. You know, uh, we breathe when we're awake. We breathe when we're asleep. Our mouth's wide open. But what do we like? Do we think about what we're breathing in? I know the more we focus on this, the kind of the grosser it feels. But when's the last time you changed your furnace filter? Go take a look. Pull it out like three inches today and just take a look at it. And you'll be like, oh, my gosh. Right. All the air that's running through your vents is running through that furnace filter. Not to gross you out. But the team at Clean Air Club wants you and your family to breathe easier this holiday season and into 2021. Make it your New Year's resolution to change your furnace filters as often as they need to be changed. Sign up at cleanairclub.ca. They deliver the furnace filters to you. And they also give you a little gift because they support local as well at cleanairclub.ca. We're also grateful for Westworld Computers. I'm reading this right now off a MacBook Pro. I'm checking my Twitter right now on a uh, iPad. And I'm checking my Instagram stories right now on my iPhone. And Sam's got the big iMac there in the corner. Westworld Computers has been powering creative ventures, business ventures, and homes in Western Canada for more than 40 years. The whole time independently and family owned our thanks to westworld computers for their ongoing support of real talk let's get to our next conversation this is going to be fascinating i have no doubt you know we were we were paying attention uh, to a twitter thread a while ago the account is wheat and oil wheat and oil and it did a really great job of i think confronting head on some of the some of the uh concerns that people have the concerns that people have about the vaccine. You know, we've talked about vaccine hesitance. Sam, are you on the record? Have you have you had any conversations with family, loved ones, people close to you that are hesitant? They're not anti-vaxxers, but they're hesitant about the vaccine. Have you had any of these personal conversations? I actually haven't. I'm I'm, <clears throat> I'm searching my brain a little bit here too because, like, you know, I I have some friends that are new parents, and I have some you know a lot of family and that kind of stuff too, and and. We're all very pro-vaccine people. So this is, you know, vaccine hesitancy, it's out there. It's understandable. It's something that I uh, know it, it, it hasn't really touched my life a whole lot, but I get it. I, I understand the fear. I was curious because, you know, we see polling and some of the polling, maybe this would be uh, part of our, you know, maybe once we get into 2021, maybe we make that one of our questions of the week through Y Station. But polling shows that between three and four out of 10 Canadians, let's say, you know, call it 35 percent approximately, depending on the poll you look, I've seen it as high as 40 percent, four in 10 Canadians hesitant about receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. That doesn't mean they're anti-vaxxers. It doesn't mean that they think that the vaccine is going to give their kids autism. It just means that they're not quite sure whether it's been rushed 
uh, whether it's not been scrutinized. And we've talked to Dr. Sajad Fazel on the program before. We've talked to Dr. Lenora Saxinger before. But I'm very curious to check in with Dr. Madhav Sarda, uh, a child psychiatrist. And you might go, well, what, is a, what does a psychiatrist have to do with vaccines? Well, Dr. Sarda is going to explain. A child psychiatrist involved in medical education at the University of Saskatchewan. And although it has no relevance in the context of a vaccine, I should also mention you grew up in Alberta. And as your Twitter handle, Wheaton Oil might suggest, a huge fan of the Edmonton Oilers. Dr. Sarda, welcome to the show. And thanks for making time for us today. Uh, Dr. Sarder, it looks like you're on mute. Really? Like, Thanks for having me. There we go. No problem. So so let's get right to this because you had a – we caught uh, wind of your Twitter thread that currently has uh, more than a quarter million likes. Obviously, it's resonated with people on vaccines. But how does a child psychiatrist get involved in talking about medical education around vaccines? What's the background here? Well, mostly really randomly. Uh, I – I mean, my job, uh, in addition to being a child psychiatrist, is in medical education. So I do a lot of teaching uh, and, and seminars to medical students and residents. And my day job obviously involves educating the families that I see. So I see kids. I have to explain things to five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 17-year-olds, parents, adults, schools, social workers, sort of getting everyone on the same page when it comes to complex topics. So that is in some ways my, my job. In terms of the vaccine piece, that was completely random. I had a bunch of people who would ask me questions like, you know, how does this vaccine work? And mostly they were people who are just in my life. You know, I'm the doctor that they know, right? So they're like, oh, hey, you're a doctor. Can you explain what's going on with this vaccine? And so I, I answered it a few times and I thought, well, you know, I have a small following of people on Twitter who uh, mostly related to hockey and all other stuff. And, and they had asked me the question too. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm sitting here waiting for a patient. They're a bit late showing up. Um, I'll, I'll put together a little thread to explain it. And I thought maybe like a handful of people would read it. The same people who sort of laugh at my random Conor McDavid jokes or, <laughs> sure. make, you know, or whatever. And then it just sort of took off almost immediately well beyond what I expected uh, it to be. Yeah, you've got you've got a hundred thousand people that have retweeted it, so it obviously resonated with people, and and and, and probably uh, one of the biggest reasons I think number one, which I benefited from personally, is is you as a medical doctor made it easy for us to understand how the vaccine actually works, and number two, I think that it works to to combat misinformation on social media, which is mm -hmm. huge. So why don't I ask you to take us into this? We're talking about the mRNA vaccines. This is the Pfizer Moderna vaccines, the two different ones, right? You talk about how mm -hmm. they're brilliant brilliant at a scientific level. Why don't you take us into this and help us understand why they're so brilliant? Well, you know, the, the idea behind the, the, the idea behind all vaccines is kind of brilliant. The idea that, okay, well, our bodies try and fight off these diseases that come in. Um, but a lot of times we've never seen these diseases before and never seen that particular virus before. So if we just give it a little bit of target practice, you know, it's like before you play a game, you practice it. A little bit. And if you practice, then you're more able and more easily able to defeat the virus. And in fact, our bodies, once we give them a chance, once we, give, once we teach them a little bit, they are really good at fighting off a lot of viruses. Uh, we just have to give them that chance. And so that's the idea behind all vaccines. For the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, uh, they took that and said, okay, well, what exactly on the virus do we need to teach our body how to attack? And the entire genome of the vaccine, or of the virus, sorry, the entire genome of the, uh, of the coronavirus was published way back in January, which is also amazing, the fact that we can get the entire genetic code of this one virus. Uh, and then scientists could look at that genetic code and say, okay, that protein there that's on the outside of the virus that protein looks like a great target to attack. Like you're in a strategy meeting, right? You got to take on... Yeah, you, you gotta you gotta take on the Toronto Maple Leafs. You gotta take on the Avalanche, and you're like, that's their weak spot right there. So we're going to practice taking that out. And so what they did was they looked at the genetic code and said, this is the code right here. This chunk here. This is the code that makes that particular protein. So let's give our bodies just that code. Nothing else. No other part of the virus. No no part of the virus really. Just that in those instructions on how to make that protein. If we give our body that, our body will just sort of see those instructions and start making it as our body does. Anytime we get the mRNA, that's the instructions to make this protein. Uh, our body will do that. Uh, and, and then 
our, but once we make that protein, our immune system knows everything in our body. Our immune system, when it sees that protein, knows it doesn't belong there. It's well aware that's not something we would normally produce. It's not part of our DNA. It knows it doesn't belong there. And so it'll immediately attack that protein. You do that and suddenly you're ready to go and, and just wire it up for whenever you see the real coronavirus. And that's basically how the vaccine works. So what, what, what would our bodies do? Uh, how would our bodies or how do our bodies fight you know, the coronavirus without the vaccine? Like, how does that work? What happens when our bodies, I'm speaking at like a grade four science level because that's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah. in my wheelhouse. But how do our bodies recognize this this foreign entity, so to speak, this bad actor, and start to respond to it without the vaccine? And, and then what does the vaccine change? I mean, you, you give the head start, right? You yeah. inject that mRNA, which is like the instructions on that protein. But but what would our bodies be doing without it? In other words, if you don't get the vaccine, but you do get sick. Yeah. So if you get the virus, our bodies will still, you know, recognize that something doesn't belong there. Again, our bodies know everything that's supposed to be there and anything that isn't supposed to be there, they're like, what, you know, what is this? Uh, and, and we'll go to attack it. The problem is that that's going to take time. Our bodies, has, it has to sort of feel out its opponent, right? It's like a boring first game in a seven game series. It's trying to figure out what the weak spot is for this virus. And it's going to find a few areas to attack and then it has to ramp up production of antibodies against those areas. And so it takes a while to figure this out strategically and tactically. Uh, and then it's gonna ramp up the antibodies and then it's gonna attack the virus. But that whole time in the days that it takes for that to happen, the body has taken, or the virus has taken over some of our cells and is making our cells replicate the virus. That's how the virus works. It takes over our cells, holds a gun to our cells heads and says, make more of me. Right. You know? Yeah, look at me, I'm the captain now, uh, and, and just makes us make more and more. And so by the time our bodies have antibodies, you know, th th this virus has millions and millions of copies in us, and now we're fighting it off. So some people are able to fight it off quickly, maybe they get fewer symptoms. Some people, unfortunately, as we know, have a really hard time with it, sometimes they die. Mm -hmm. And so what the, what the vaccine does differently is that when we already have a memory of this vaccine, uh, or this virus, when we already have a memory of that protein, then we can ramp up and attack it very quickly. It doesn't take days and days and days. We know exactly what to do to attack that protein and we can get at it before the virus can get in our cells and start replicating and start making us sick. We're ready to go. Do you, can you, I mean, obviously I understand like if, if someone would have had, uh, you know, I have a friend that, that really got put through the ringer with COVID. She barely survived it. She was in a coma. Um, and, and they've wondered if perhaps uh, a lung infection that she had when she was like 18 months old uh, may have been part of the reason why she struggled. People that have uh, asthma or breathing difficulties or can have other, you know, medical conditions that obviously mean that that COVID they would have a more difficult time fighting or they'd be much more susceptible to, to serious harm or even death uh, were they to get sick. Other people um, will have COVID-19 and either not even know it, uh, be asymptomatic, mm -hmm. or they'll, they'll, they'll have like, you know, you described as the tickle in the throat, a bit of a fever, mm -hmm. you know, they, they self-isolate, they stay to themselves and they're perfectly fine. Um, there's such a wide range. Is it possible, uh, don't roll your eyes at the question, but is it possible to explain, uh, aside from obvious things like, you know, you, you had, you know, cystic fibrosis and your lungs couldn't handle it or something like that. But is there a reason why two otherwise healthy people might have two completely different reactions to COVID-19? Is that something you can explain basically? Yeah. The, the issue is that, first of all, there's no questions after that you have to worry about, you know, rolling your eyes about the whole point of this is that there's not a lot of bad questions. It's all just trying to make sense of it. And, you know, through that thread that I posted that people have had some really legitimate and honest questions about the basics of this because people are interested in it. And these are natural questions that kind of come up. Yeah. So that's a really good one. And I think that um, there's a few different reasons why, and, and part of it is a bit of random chance. Some people are just more unlucky and some people are lucky. Some people fall off a ladder and they just get up miraculously, everything's fine. Some people fall off the ladder if they're the same age, same bone structure, everything else should be fine about them. They don't have osteoporosis. They don't have any previous breaks. They should be fine, but they fall off the ladder and they're, they break their ankle. And it's just the way it landed, just, just the luck of the draw, right? So sometimes it's that. The other fact is that our immune systems are all a little bit different. And so maybe it takes a little bit longer for one immune system to figure out how to attack the virus than another. And it's just our, 
body didn't get get at it the right way. And it's not that we have a weak immune system or a bad immune system. It just didn't happen that way. You know, sometimes you have a really strong immune system and, you know, you still lose to a worse virus. Um, uh, just like a good, the best team in hockey doesn't always win, right? Sometimes it's just bad luck. But also, you know, in addition to that, uh, I think that's probably the, the probably the, the, the biggest part of it. But also, you know, some people do have underlying conditions that make them at higher risk. And also sometimes the way you get the virus makes a difference, right? So let's say you got a little bit of the virus, just a few, you know, virus particles, you got a few versions of the virus into your body and that's what got you infected. Well, there wasn't a whole lot to begin with. And then it didn't have it, then your body reacted to it and started ramping up immunity um, and, and you were able to get on it quickly. But then other people may have had loss of exposure to the virus. They're in a situation where they got a ton of virus into them and you know, day after day after day. And now there's a lot more virus as an initial exposure and that's ramping up. Sometimes it, it, sometimes it just our immune response didn't work the way we wanted it to. So there's a few different reasons. Some of it's bad luck, some of it's underlying conditions, some of it's the level of exposure that you happen to get. Um, all of those things play into why people get different responses. It's interesting. We're talking to Dr. Madhav Sarda. If you're just tuning in right now on Mixler, watching us live on YouTube, uh, a medical educator out of the University of Saskatchewan and a child psychiatrist, medical doctor, obviously. Um, doctor, a lot of talk about this. Uh, I'm not using the scientific forms, but kind of the mutated uh, virus, what they're noticing in the UK and what we're getting preliminary understanding <laughs> on. It's, it's what's prompting all of the, the travel warnings, the concerns about people uh, coming in from the UK to Canada. And, and there's some concern, although we, we heard earlier today, uh, BioNTech executives saying that they still have scientific confidence in their vaccine, uh, regardless of whether or not it has mutated. You touch on this a little bit. Can, can you dumb it down for us? Uh, so, uh, it, the first of all, the mutation itself uh, that's going in the UK, we don't know if it started in the UK or if it started somewhere else and moved to the UK, um, but the first thing to know is that virus mutations happen all the time, right? Remember how I, I said just now that the virus gets into our cells and make our, makes our cells make copies of it over and over and over again, but it, we don't make copies the way you might do it at a printer or like a Xerox machine or in Word, you don't just sort of say 10 copies, 20 copies, 30 copies, a million copies print, and you get the exact version of every single copy of the virus. Our bodies, our cells are writing out the virus DNA by hand. It's like the virus is sort of threatening it. And it's just sitting there like Bart Simpson at the opening credits of the Simpsons writing out each line of the virus over and over and over again. And if you've ever written lines because you've gotten in trouble at school, you'll know eventually you're going to make a mistake in the letters and have to race and go back. But when we talk about RNA viruses or the type of viruses that this is, there's no spell check. There's no eraser. You make a mistake, you just keep going. So every time you make a mistake writing out the virus genome, every time you make a mistake writing out the virus, that mistake stays. And most of the time, those mistakes make no sense. They, they make the virus do something weird and the virus just collapses and it doesn't do anything. But sometimes by complete random chance, it does something different to the virus. It makes the virus spread faster or it makes it more deadly or it makes it less deadly or, or it makes it spread less well. Just something changes and the virus continues on that way. And whenever you, that changes, whenever you make a change in that virus RNA that, that was just a typo, every other version of that virus after that will keep that typo. In my Twitter thread, I talked about a, had the virus having a sweater vest. It's kind of like, okay, something random happens. Now the virus is a sweater vest. And every other virus after that will have a sweater vest. It's just the sweater vest virus now, right? And sometimes you'll see, and all around the world right now, there are all these different mutations of COVID, you know, in Canada, in the States, probably different places in Canada, all these different mutations that we don't even know about. And it's okay, they're all kind of similar. Uh, our body will recognize them pretty similarly. They're both, they're all about equally deadly. You know, the, we expect there to be some mutations. This mutation in the UK seems like it spreads faster. We don't know that 100% for sure, but it seems like it. And yeah. that's the concern about so it. So like more, I guess spreads faster. Is it, does that equal more contagious? I mean, is that even a thing? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, that's the idea. That it spreads faster is more contagious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Doc, we, we, we now wonder, um, we know that this is like a two-part vaccine. I'm hearing that you, you get your shots about a month apart uh, from one another. Mm -hmm. is, is it way too soon to know how long this would last for, your, your so-called, yeah. uh, I mean, you probably would hesitate to use the word immunity, but, but how long would this be effective for? You know, we don't know for, for sure. 
you know, because the virus has only been around for a year. So we don't even know how long people who got the virus are immune, right? Uh, it, it, we can't know that 100% until we have enough time that goes by. We can guess, we can hope, but the reality is that you, you, we don't know uh, without, without data. And the same is true of the vaccine. We don't know. We know that the, we know they followed people for several months in the trials, right? They, they, the Pfizer had 44,000 people in their trials. The Moderna had 30,000 people in their trials. You know, half got the vaccine, half got a placebo, and they followed these people for, for a few months. And at the end of that, they still were able to, to have an idea of, of, of their immunity because they weren't, getting, they weren't getting COVID after that. But whether that goes on for six months, a year, 10 years, a lifetime, we don't know yet. Part of the reason of getting two doses, though, is to help make sure that we get the best possible immune response, you know, like get our memory of that, of that protein intact and strong. Um, and part of it is to make sure that that memory is as long lasting as it possibly can. Uh, but we will have to see how long our, our immunity and our protection against this virus lasts. Now, if it does run out, it's not going to be an on-off switch. It's not going to be like, oh, you know, December 2021, suddenly all of us are no longer immune, yeah. right? Everyone is going to slow. It's going to be different for everybody. It's going to be a bit of random chance. Some people are going to sort of drift off. We'll have some advanced warning because we're going to be tracking people with antibody levels. Not everyone who gets the virus, but there'll be some people in the studies who are continued along and we'll be able to see what their antibody levels are. So seeing what their, you know, what their strength is to this, to this virus. That's not going to be a hundred percent certain. We're not going to know for sure, but it'll give us some advanced warning uh, of possibilities, but you know, as with everything in life, the truth is going to be when we get there and we're just going to have to have our data and we're going to have to know what's happening and I have, be ready I have, and see if we even need a booster. Yeah. Yeah. A booster. Right. I, I have, uh, I have uh, two questions to close doctor. We're talking to Dr. Uh, Madhav Sarda, uh, who, by the way, uh, we should note you delayed the start of, of a class so you could be here with us today. <laughs> We should note that yeah. that's that's pretty incredible uh, in the interest of medical education. I mean, people like Dwayne are watching right now. Dwayne says, you're the reason, Dr. Sarda, why I love science uh, says thank you. So people <laughs> appreciate this. Um, two questions, both of them probably impossible to answer because they both look into the future. One of them has to do with the Edmonton Oilers, but the one that doesn't. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you this in Alberta, uh, you know, just west of where you're at in Saskatchewan. We had a, a once in 100 year flood event. Um, and then mm. we've had a whole bunch of devastating floods since. We had a once in 100 year wildfire um, in <laughs> Slave Lake. And then we had another once in 100 year wildfire in Fort McMurray. And we've had a whole bunch of other wildfires that have been very concerning. In other words, they're not happening once every 100 years. Now, the Spanish flu was here impacting families in 1918. Here in 2019, 101 years later, we encounter COVID 19. Mm. Do you think, and again, I recognize impossible to answer, but I'm curious to see how you will answer it. Do you think it'll be another hundred years before we encounter something else like this? Or how do you believe society will be reset to approach something like this, a pandemic like this again down the line? You know, I hope it's going to be a hundred years before we see something like this. Uh, as you said, we, it's impossible to know. We don't know for sure. We don't know if changes in our environment and climate are going to make some of these things more likely or more common. We don't know if, you know, greater human population and crowding make things uh, spread a little bit more. We don't know if some of our uh, other practices around the world are, are impacting this. Um, but, you know, I, I hope these things, I hope this doesn't happen again for, for quite some time. Now, that said, um, we are better prepared to deal with it now than we were a hundred years ago because of our ability to make this vaccine. It took a year, like a year ago, we didn't, we didn't know about this virus. None of us, just if we had this conversation a year ago out on this day, we would not be talking about COVID. We would have had no idea about it coming. And now a year later, we've, we've got a vaccine that's being delivered. So our ability to respond to these things is, is unprecedented and, and amazing and cool from a science perspective. So I hope that if something like this happens in the future, either to this extent, worse or better, we'll be better prepared for it. And we have had threats in the past. You know, people remember the H1N1 virus that came by. Um, and then we had a vaccine for that. That didn't affect things uh, on the scale that, that COVID has. Um, but there will be other viruses that come up, and I, and I hope and think that we're better prepared to handle it. But I also hope that our experience learning from this as a society uh, makes us prepared for if and when it happens again. No kidding. All right. 
the Oilers, uh, the other half of your passion, uh, aside from medical education. Um, people can follow you on Twitter at Wheat and Oil. Uh, let's get your prediction for this upcoming year. Shortened season, 56 games. The North Division, we, we've voted here in the Real Talk studio. It needs to be called the, the Great White North Division. All Canadian teams, the Oilers will be playing two of them. We expect the Calgary Flames will be one of them. Uh, ten times. They'll play the other teams nine mm-hmm. times. They've got... Uh, arguably the two best players in the world. I will go on the record to say they have two of the top five players in the world. Uh, I, I in, don't think in, that's disputed. In Leon Dreisaitl. Oh, yeah, people would argue. Sidney Crosby belongs on the list. Well, anyway, we're talking anyway. about top five, I, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. What do you think is going to happen with the Edmonton Oilers this season? Oh, a shortened season makes it super random. It's like it's going to be wild because of the shortened season. In addition to that, Um, I am, although I I am very, I'm, I feel very strongly about having McDavid and dry saddle gives us a huge strength up front. Uh, I'll admit I'm a little bit concerned about our goaltending and whether that's going to hold steady. Uh, it didn't so much in the playoffs last year. And when you're a hockey team, you know, hockey is like hockey is 90% goaltending. And then if you don't have goaltending, it's hundred percent goaltending. So like that, that to me makes the entire thing a bit of a toss up. Uh, I think that we have the capacity to, to make the playoffs. I think we have the capacity to make a push. And then once you get in the playoffs with, uh, with, you know, w- with, unsure goaltending but the best players in the world yeah uh, it's a complete crapshoot uh, which is going to be super exciting and i think we have the capacity to make a huge a, a, a deep drive into the playoffs um but it's going to be really random okay so madov who's going to be the first canadian team or let me say who's going to be the next canadian team to win the stanley cup oh it's going to be the Oilers. not a boy there you go hey <laughs> Thank you so much. It said we promised we'd have you up by 10 o'clock because your students are waiting for you. Med students, the University of Saskatchewan. Thank you so much for this. Uh, we, we could talk science with you all day. A real testament to how you approach your calling in life. Thank you so much for this, doctor. Thank you, Ryan. You got it. That's Dr. Madhav Sarda uh, out of the University of Saskatchewan, a child psychiatrist, a medical educator. Okay, so let's hear your argument. So, so, you, so you would argue that McDavid and Drysaddle are the two best players in the world? No, no, I didn't say the, de- I, I said I agree they're on the top five. Oh, in the top five. Yes. Okay. I was like, I don't think anybody can dispute that. Yeah. Oh yeah. No one will dispute top five. Top two, I think you'd get, you'd, you'd get pushback and rightfully so. I think Sidney Crosby still belongs in that conversation. There are, he has the long, like, what are you evaluating? I love you know what I mean? We talk for hockey. It, it, now like, we're going to talk hockey. <laughs> well, I, like, I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole, but it's just like, I mean, raw numbers, goals scored. It's undisputedly McDavid and Dreisaitl. We saw that last year. We saw that from the numbers last year. Um, I don't think that's how you measure the best player. You know, Sidney Crosby has a storied career, multiple cup wins. Totally. And is a leader of our national team when they compete. You know, and, 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 Dreisaitl and McDavid are just not old enough to have those accolades yet, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah We're you, not comparing apples to apples. Yeah, you have to look at... So Crosby's won, he's won, you know, obviously World Junior. He's won multiple Stanley Cups. He's won multiple Olympic gold medals. Uh, you know, McDavid and Dreisaitl have, have a, a row to hoe uh, before they're... I mean, I think... I, I don't think that there's any... Art, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, there's no debate that Connor McDavid is the best hockey player in the world. Um, But you'll also see polling from NHL players, which is really interesting, that when they're asked, who would you rather have on your team, game seven, everything on the line to win the Stanley Cup, the overwhelming majority of NHL players say Sidney Crosby. That's who they would have one game only to win the Stanley Cup. They would take Cros. Because he performs under pressure. We've seen it happen over and over and over again, right? Like Sidney Crosby will step up when his back is up against the wall. Yeah, no kidding. Um, Why don't we take a quick look? Uh, First of all, I want to remind everybody about the team at Dairy Queen. Uh, Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park are amazing partners of this broadcast, Real Talk. Uh, Let me call up the the, the locations because I want to name them uh, specifically because here's the deal. At these six locations, I've been telling you this, and I'm going to bang the drum all the way through till Christmas Day. Uh, The Christmas frozen ice cream logs are half price for Real Talk audience members. Until Christmas Day at only the following six locations. So Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. 
All right. That's Mark and Mike that own these six locations, employing local people, keeping the people fed, and the Christmas frozen ice cream logs, so long as you reference Real Talk, are 50% off. So a huge shout out to Dairy Queen for that. We also wanted to say thank you to the team at Alta Moving and Storage. We know this is the time of year you're going to start making plans, whether it's a New Year's resolution or something else, whether it's uh, uh, the reality check that you it's time to downsize, or maybe it's time to upsize. Right? Maybe being at home with your family you love them, but they are driving you crazy and you need more space. And if you're going to keep working from home, you're going to need a home office and the kids need to develop basement because gosh darn it. If they play mini sticks against the living room wall one more time. Okay. So if you're considering a move, Alta Moving and Storage has these pod style containers. They can drop them off. They make it nice and easy for you. They can even provide movers to load them and unload them if you need, or you can do it yourself. The whole idea here is a perfect custom fit. And if you require long or even short-term storage, they've got you covered there as well. It's kind of the one-stop shop locally owned and operated at Alta Moving and Storage. You can find more about what they do uh, under the sponsors link at ryanjesperson.com. So let's take a quick look at the headlines. Uh, Of course, a lot of it has to do with COVID right now. Well, word from Dr. Dina Hinshalbert, as Chief Medical Officer of Health, anybody in the province that's recently traveled from the United Kingdom is being asked to get tested for COVID-19, whether or not you're showing symptoms. You've just rolled in from Manchester. You're feeling great. Doesn't matter. Go get tested for COVID-19 on Monday. That's yesterday. The announcement, all travelers coming to Alberta from the UK will be contacted and offered an appointment to get tested. Anyone who enters Canada, this might be you, must isolate for 14 days unless you're participating in that rapid testing pilot program. We also wanted to mention quickly as you're hearing about this vaccine and some of the concerns around this evolving coronavirus. We just talked about it with Dr. Marta there. Uh, The chief executive of BioNTech, that's Ugar Sahin, said uh, early this morning in an interview just a few hours ago, quote, we don't know at the moment if our vaccine is also able to provide protection against this new variant but because of the proteins which we all know about now right thanks to dr madov uh because of the proteins on the variant are 99 percent the same as the prevailing strains biontech has scientific confidence in this vaccine in other words they still suggest that this will be adequate for what people need so there you have it there's your news update uh, for this morning uh, Sam, I also wanted to take a moment. You know, we've been getting so many incredible emails from people, and we haven't really set aside a time, a specific time to get into it. This is something that the show might evolve toward, but this one from Yvonne. Now, you're tagged on all the emails. Did you see Yvonne's email the other day about head coverings? This, yes. Wasn't this great? Mm-hmm. I told you, I, I wrote Yvonne back and I said, hey, listen. I said, we're going to make time in the show to talk about this in particular. This was following our Friday roundtable. What a remarkable roundtable with three incredible human beings talking about meaningful, individual, and societal responses to racism. Like, Like, how should we respond? What should we do? There's some pretty nasty trends that we're seeing right now. And by trends, I mean racist attacks targeting human beings based on who they are. And we're seeing that in Alberta. We've seen at least three examples in Edmonton, and we see examples in other parts of the province way too frequently. So Yvonne, here's this roundtable. If you missed it, you can find it anywhere you get your podcast. You can obviously watch it by way of our YouTube channel, and we thank everybody that subscribes there. I think we're at 4,000 now. We're flirting with 4,000 subscribers, which is great. We'd love to see it at 5,000 by the new year. Yvonne writes in. She emailed talk at ryanjesperson.com. She says, another great conversation on Real Talk with with knowledgeable and authentic humans. Yvonne says, I was married to a Muslim man from South Africa. We have two kids together. My goodness, she says. Um, I don't know if this is a weird thing to say about somebody that emailed in, but just, just so you can, I have her picture here. Just like blonde, blue eyes, okay? Just, it, it's relevant to her, to the, the text here. She says, my goodness, learning about Islam as a white Canadian Alberta girl raising two Muslim kids has been a journey. She says the women in his family did not wear head coverings except for religious events, but out of respect, I did when I took the kids to mosque for Sunday school or for summer school. And she says, and if you would like an experience, put on a Muslim head covering and walk down the street. She says, I never really understood it, the blowback, because I see Mennonite and Hutterite women all the time 
with their heads covered wearing traditional clothing. She says, I think society learns its responses from the media. Yvonne says, I grew up in northern Alberta with a well-educated father, so embracing a monotheistic religion wasn't difficult for my family, although sometimes the questions were interesting. She says, as a side note, as an aside, my dad was a teacher and did teach about residential schools. Yvonne's touching on something else we got to on the show. She says, I'd like to recommend that your viewers, that your listeners, check out a website. It's muslimgirl.com. She says it's very powerful, a website out of the United States. She says you may want to share it with your guests if they don't already know about it. And she said, frankly, by the way, I also do think you need to do some sort of an after show to talk about what you and Sam talk about after the broadcast. Yvonne says, I feel like I have an opinion on all of your topics Thank you for creating a much-needed platform. That from Yvonne. Yvonne, we're so grateful that you took the time to write into the show, uh, emailing talk at ryanjesperson.com. Thank you for that. She makes such a good point, doesn't she, about head coverings relating to certain religions. And she talks about how she sees Mennonite or Hutterite women wearing traditional head coverings all the time. No response from general society in whichever part of the province that she's in. She says, but if she would wear her uh, uh, a head covering relating to her Muslim faith, she said, described it as quite an experience walking down the street. It's an interesting point to make. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it, it's lived experience that I think most of us can't relate to right that's that's the whole point of being uncomfortable in these conversations is um the first thing you need to do to understand is to admit to yourself that you can't understand you can't walk in their shoes you can't have the same lived experiences as some of the people that we're talking about and um starting from a place of empathy and open-mindedness and understanding is the best approach for it Interesting comment here from from Fatima on our on our YouTube comments, and and I only I can only see uh, her thumbnail photo, and it's just tiny, so I can I apologize if I'm if I'm uh, you, know, you know she's Doctor Mona Saleh's sister. What? Yeah, she oh, comments like every single day. I didn't know that that was her sister. Yeah, wonderful. So a hijabi woman. Um, and thank you for watching, by the way, and thank you for chiming in to everybody that leaves comments. And, and this is like this fills our tank through the show to see you all so engaged on this. Anyway, the comment that she makes, she says, my husband is uh, fair skinned, passes as white, uh, says he feels a palpable difference when he's alone and then when we're together which is actually a really discouraging and heartbreaking comment, but I appreciate you making it, and that's a great reality check. We value every bit of feedback that you send us to the show. We would not continue to push our email addresses out. We would not continue to mention our hashtag, RealTalkRJ, and our YouTube comments if we didn't want to know what you have to say. That also includes our question of the week, which you'll find at ryanjesperson.com. Uh, before we go, I wanted to remind you again about the team at Local Waste. Now, they sponsor trash talk which is coming up every friday at 10 o'clock now because this friday is christmas day we want you to be with your loved ones with your families that's where we're gonna be i mean not all of them but we're gonna have our tiny little uh family units together sam you and your loved ones me and my loved ones we're gonna be off the air on christmas day we encourage you to do the exact same thing let the screens power down that means that we're gonna be we're not skipping trash talk are you nuts we've already got a folder full just from this week alone uh, some pretty incredible submissions again to talk at ryanjesperson.com so thursday at 10 o'clock we're gonna bring you uh that's christmas eve morning a special edition of trash talk presented by the team at local waste for more than 25 years they've been in the waste management game going up against the big guys that's right they're independent family owned locally operating as well and looking to expand their business you know chris labossier uh, the owner at local waste told me that when we mentioned that previously if you know for example there might be alberta saskatchewan or bc based entrepreneurs out there that would be interested in bringing local waste to their communities he said we didn't really realize the power of real talk he said we got some very significant leads had some very significant conversations so if that's something that maybe you'd consider as a business venture in the new year give chris a call at 780-242-9746 and if you think that local waste might be a good fit in your community for your business Check him out at localwaste.ca. Coming up tomorrow, uh, Professor Sylvain Charlebois sent his regrets. Life happens. Things happen. And at the very last minute, uh, he tweets at Food Professor. He was supposed to be joining us. 
And at like 8.25 this morning, he was like, oh my gosh, I have a thing. And we went, okay, we've got some emails to read, but it makes tomorrow's bookings nice and easy. So we're going to be talking about food trends, including grocery prices tomorrow out of the gates with Professor Sylvain Charlebois. Until then.